gentlemen this is ryan your host of the hero paranormal podcast Uh, i've been having a lot of people asking me what hero paranormal is about what does hero paranormal stand for well to put it simply it is the hyper anomalous esoteric research organization but more importantly it is the heroes um, in status those of the paranormal field or the fringe of culture who have that hero status or ability to give tremendous amounts to the field. And uh, tonight we have, uh, in my opinion, a very big hero in the paranormal field. He's an Arizona man who has a paranormal property. And uh, being a paranormal property owner myself, I can attest that it can become very difficult to not only manage the property, and the opinions expressed by usually the elites who also seem to have a tendency to want to collect these paranormal properties and do research on them of course but the uh the field in general um ufology cryptozoology and the paranormal field has a tendency to attack those who have had experiences that are beyond the norm or uh hero status and um, that's the case with with a lot of individuals now the individual today is quite amazing and he well he's the owner of the stardust ranch in rainbow valley about an hour west of phoenix and um, he has dealt with harassment constantly and he's a very well-grounded individual and he has endured a barrage of activity much like other ranches with similar paranormal attributes Um, a few come to mind the uh, bradshaw ranch also in arizona arizona is quite the hot spot and my hat is off to um, the individuals who go to arizona in search of research one of those individuals is nathan colenshaw Nathan is most well known for being the founder of the Utah UFO Fest, a a wonderful get-together in a beautiful part of the state, Cedar City, Utah, and uh, he's done an amazing job at gathering people with similar interests to speak about things that are usually not acceptable. And uh, hats off to Nathan. Nathan's not only limited at that, He's trying to do the same thing in Arizona, and I hope he has all the support that he can possibly have. I know he's got mine. And with Arizona, there is just a multitude of energies and extreme locations where these type of things have the ability to come into our dimension and interact uh, in a very different way than is usually the case. Now. The property that Mr. John Edmonds owns, uh, the Stardust Ranch, it's been featured on, you name it, Ghost Adventures, the Travel Channel. Um, It's got international acclaim at this point, and, well, it's not old news. As John has told me, there are some new things going on, and John would know. On another note, I would like to, well, explain why I haven't done a podcast at least a free podcast i've i've done some patron only podcasts but i haven't done a free podcast in well it's been a minute uh, at least a couple of weeks a little over that and that's because well there's been a lot going on uh, i had a trip to utah uh, had a trip to uh, texas and i also 
Well, went to the Storm Area 51 event to get a very real and, uh, in my opinion, honest look at what's going on. And it's surrounded by a lot of controversy. And that's unfortunate because I think it was a big win. Much like the original Burning Man who only had, oh, I don't know, eight people show up. Um, it was a win because you have people of like mind, like attitude, just overall great folks. I didn't run into one person I didn't like. And really there was nothing, no drama to speak of. I think one person uh, happened to alleviate themselves uh, in public, even though it's far from public. It's quite out there in the middle of nowhere, but that was the that's 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 the story that the nation got is oh somebody was arrested well that's true there was probably just as many uh, officers and uh, personnel as there were individuals there by the looks of it uh, which is good the uh, emergency personnel were there for a good reason uh, it's a location that's very difficult to uh, withstand just the heat lack of water uh, lack of services and I think everybody did a good job and uh, I, I think it's getting a bum rap. So don't, don't let that narrative discourage you from going in the future. Is it for everybody? Absolutely not. Was it for me? I don't know. Um, I was there the day before the uh, Storm Area 51 event, so I can't actually speak as far as the storm itself, but I'll tell you the calm before the storm was just amazing. Great people. Uh, Paul Oakenfold uh, showed up and did a concert and that I'm aware, I believe it was free. That kind of gives you the idea of what, what kind of people we're dealing with, quality individuals. Um, we also had uh, George Knapp was there and Jeremy Corbell. And um, it seems like they're always there when it's a grassroots type of uh, event uh, to support the public and to basically disclose what it is they know and um, help out in any way, shape or form that they can. And there were other individuals that were there as well. Alien Dave Rosenfeld, you may know him from the Utah UFO Hunters. And um, I saw a lot of other individuals who I have a lot of respect for, including Nick Pope and many others. Too many, too many to mention, to be honest. But it was very nice to just see so many people, if you're into this sort of thing, you know, taking some time to get away in a place that is magical to them and to enjoy each other's company. That's really all I saw. Now, I left before things, I guess, got a little bit hectic, but it sounds to me like it was a big win. And I, my hat's off to Jeremy Corbell, to George Knapp, and to all those who took the time and the effort to go out and actually put their money where their mouth is. There's, there's many people who talk a mean game, but they never show up. And uh, armchair research is great. I, 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 I plan on doing a lot of it in my retirement, but I'm nowhere close to being retired and I don't plan on doing it anytime soon. So while these old legs of mine keep working and uh, I can still get out there and have a good time with people who believe that possibilities are much greater than the majority of the public believe well I'll take my I'll take my chances with those folks I mean really good people so to everyone that went out there a great thanks to everybody that didn't I guess I should give you a great thanks too because much like Burning Man which I have never gone but I've heard it started very small I believe uh, you know and and the nice thing is you talk to people that go now and they say gosh I wish I wish it was the way it used to be I wish it was still small and you know, it's huge now. So um, I, I felt very blessed to be there on the first uh, event of that type. I believe there's going to be very many more and it will be a yearly thing. And uh, yeah, it definitely caught national attention. I guess, I guess the reality of the public not accepting the narrative that has been spoon fed to them is uh, it's starting to wear a little bit thin and people know that there's there's more going on whatever that is and a lot of that has to do with your own perception so my perception was it was a great time and so if you know people that went don't give them a hard time and um, something I should mention uh, we are still plugging forward with podcasts we are doing our best to bring you the heroes of the paranormal bringing you everything the hyper-anomalous, esoteric research organization can gather. And there's many facets that are involved here. We recently did some research with 
uh, group uh, from all over, all over the country, um, from Europe uh, and others. And we were involved with a project called Space Wolf Research, which is really just a little tiny ranch where we're looking at the sky and trying to interact with much of the same type of phenomena that others, um, such as Mr. John Edmonds, uh, I have to take my hats off to E. Seti, um, Gilliland Ranch, uh, there's, there's too many to mention, and the more there are, the better in my opinion, because this is not something that should be held by a select few, this is something that is for all of us, and the more of us are out there trying to make it happen, I, I don't think that's a bad thing. So let's stay positive and keep our eyes to the skies, right? On another note, please support Hero Paranormal Podcast in any way you can. Go to heroparanormal.com and there you can uh, become a patron um, and you can get those patron-only episodes that no one else can hear. You also get special content, and we're working on a bunch of other things that we can bring you. Also stop by the Hero Paranormal store, pick up a hat, a t-shirt, whatever. It is just kind of showing your true colors and that you are interested in this type of thing. Also, if you don't want to be a patron, no big deal. You can uh, donate as little as a dollar, and you can only do it once if you want. You can do one-time donations. Don't be scared by that donate button. It will say, you know, recurring payment. Not a big deal. You hit the button, you make a one-time donation of one, five, ten dollars, and it's not recurring. You just go back into Manage Account, you hit Stop Recurring Payment, and you just donated once, which I am truly thankful for. It's hard to pay for all these things, and uh, I never believed it was expensive as it is, but you know, it's worth it. And I will continue to do it as long as I'm physically and financially able. Uh, also stop by uh, our partner sites, like um, the Utah UFO Hunters. Uh, that's a great, great site, uh, ran by Alien Dave Rosenfeld, true veteran in the field. He's come under a lot of scrutiny lately, and uh, so have all of us here in Utah. There's been there's been some movements towards uh, really just kind of going after anybody that came before them and trying to uh, blaze their own trail and, and, and pretend like they came up with all the answers. Well, they didn't. And uh, we didn't either. Uh, you got to pass the baton and be open-minded. And research is supposed to be a community effort. So in your own community, get involved with these types of research organizations and support them. Do the same for other podcasts. I, I, my hat goes off to uh, the Higher Side Chats and Mr. Greg Carlwood. It was his inspiration, really, that got me doing anything at all. And um, the reason is, you know, the more we are able to document and keep a recorded history, whether audio or otherwise, written, whatever the case may be, it's very important because these are things that traditionally were only spoken by mouth and then lost. And thus comes the disbelief. Well, Mr. Greg Carlwood has blazed the path for a phenomenal amount of podcasts, in my opinion. I'm not going to speak for others, but I know he definitely inspired me. And so definitely, if you have a chance, go to the Higher Side Chats and donate there. Become a patron of that. They have the Higher Side Chats Plus. It's an epic, epic podcast. In all honesty, I think it's the best in the game. But we're going to do our best. And I know that there's a lot of others that are doing their best. And... Uh, People like him are very hard to come by. They are true heroes as well. In addition, uh, if you're interested in things uh, that go bump in the night and research projects that allow the best of the best researchers to get their opinions and possibly interact with phenomena in locations that are not typically accessible, go to spacewolfresearch.com. It is a small but a very honest research organization that is continually trying to get to the bottom of, not the answer of, but get to the bottom of the rabbit hole. We want to experience it all, see it all, and we're doing so with unconventional methods. That, well, methods that haven't been used before, so we're trying to do our part, and hopefully if we are able to give a little something, that means a big deal to me. And uh, on to our guest, Mr. John Edmonds. His property has been featured internationally. Uh, it holds secrets to what I believe are the answers to our very existence and, and, and what else exists in this universe. John Edmonds is a 
fantastic individual, and I couldn't be more honored that he's on this podcast. Please also support John and anything that he does. So let's get to John Edmonds and the mysteries of the Stardust Ranch and see what's new and what's happening now. Hello, John. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you very much. Oh, well, I am so excited to chat with you today. I am ecstatic to hear that uh, there, there may be some new developments at the Stardust Ranch. I, I know that a lot of people are aware you, you've, you, your property is, has had international acclaim. If it, It's kind of like if people don't know about it, they're probably not too involved with the paranormal. But could you kind of give us, um, for those that don't know, because it, there, there, there is a pretty big audience, you never know. It, could you give us a little bit of background and history and your experiences on, on your magical property, sir? Well, I don't know about it being magical. It's uh, more like infamous. <laughs> um, we bought the ranch uh, in uh, 1996, uh, moved in June 1st of the same year, thinking that we bought a, a good horse property out in the middle of nowhere, uh, about 40, 45 miles southwest of Phoenix, Arizona. And, uh, you know, the idea was to just kind of take this property and turn it into a, a nice show property and rescue horses and uh, turn around and train the horses and use them uh, for equine therapy with our veterans and with kids that were uh, not able to uh, do therapy in a traditional way, you know, in an office someplace and uh, to help women that were survivors of domestic violence. Uh, both my wife and I have uh, backgrounds, extensive backgrounds, in uh, providing therapy and counseling and doing work, uh, you know, with all those populations. And, you know, I was trying to kind of combine my love of horses with my love of trying to uh, help people that are trying to recover from, uh, you know, tough positions in life and, uh, you know, different experiences that they've had. Um, unfortunately, it turned out to be just about anything but that. Uh, we found out after we moved in and after we'd been here for a little bit that the property was smack dab in the middle of uh, UFO Central and that it was being visited by ETs from various different parts of the universe and that we uh, were not wanted here and that we were going to have to fight for everything that we had and that it was going to be the battle and sort of an epic battle uh, for as long as we held the property. Now it's been 25 years. I've killed 19 greys that have been here on the property that have fought me uh, every which way there was to try to get rid of us and uh, so on and so forth. It's It's been the most uh, trying experience of my life, and I've had plenty of them, and at the same time, uh, it's just been unbelievable. You know, my wife and I are grounded in, uh, you know, mental health, and my wife worked for the FBI as well. And, and uh, you know, so the last thing in the world we ever thought we were ever going to encounter was anything from, you know, off-planet. And, you know, we, we've just struggled all these years to try to hold the property and trying to figure out, you know, how to deal with it. Fascinating, John. It's it's interesting, and I don't want to I don't want to draw correlations to other paranormal properties, which there's many in Arizona, as you're aware. There's also some in Utah, and and, and I'm reminded, you know, that that 1996 date reminds me of the old Sherman Ranch there in Utah, and and I'm wondering, I'm I'm very interested because it seems like. You know, you had such an altruistic direction um, for your property. You know, the equine therapy, veterans and kids, and having the backgrounds you do with uh, yourself and your wife. I mean, having worked for the FBI, she did. And and I, I've noticed this with other individuals who work with, you know, mental health and, and, and people that are really just trying to do the right thing, that sometimes these altruistic directions can take a really quick turn now these ets um i'm fascinated by the the i think everybody's fascinated by grays but that's because we're not living with them like you are and and uh the majority of people anyway and 
you mentioned that it's UFO central. I think a lot of people are aware that Arizona is kind of, it's one of those areas that is fairly fringe. There's, there's something about it. And, you know, I've been to places like the Bradshaw Ranch. I have uh, an acquaintance of mine, uh, Mr. Ryan Skinner, who I believe has met with you. And he was fascinated to hold the actual samurai sword. He thought you were a great guy. And, you know, it's just it's just wild that such an altruistic direction for the property would take such a wild turn. Do you have any insight as to what might have caught? Was has it always been this way? Well, we've been told uh, part of the background on this place, you know, because I had like zero insight about any of this stuff. I didn't even really want to believe too much in ETs or or anything. I was. You know, pretty much just your garden variety, strict Christian, and and to me, anything that had anything to do with anything that wasn't, uh, you know, clearly uh, good meant it was evil, and probably meant it was, you know, not related to uh, anything to do with Christianity. You know, sort of the the old idea that, you know, all this stuff was probably demonic, and and that it was, you know, just downright ugly, bad, and you know, there was no in between. What I discovered was is that over time, as I tried to open my mind to try to cope and understand this thing, and that is, it's not that simple. Um, yeah, definitely there is things that, that we would consider to be demonic, uh, it, but not everything that, that we don't understand is demonic. It, it, in this case, it's from elsewhere, you know? I mean, we've got DNA proof, we've got photos, we've got video, we've got artifacts, you know, we've got two portals that just happen to be on the property. We've had things come through the portal and, uh, you know, literally kind of like clue us in about how all this stuff works and why it's this way. And, you know, we just happen to be in the absolutely wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> I mean, I, I was, you know, not looking for this kind of an education at all. You know, I'm a social worker. I'm a therapist. Um you know, the last thing in the world I ever wanted to do was was be the involuntary, uh, you know, participant here. My wife certainly even less than, than I am. So, um, you know, the interesting thing about the ranch is you've got Skinwalker, you've got Bradshaw, and then below that, but those other two ranches, you have us. And out of the three, we're the only ones that have just stayed and fought it out. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm one of those guys, you know, that, you know, I paid cold hard money for this place and I'd be damned if I'm going to let it be run, be run off by a bunch of these little bastards. And, uh, you know, so I, I've just slugged it out with them. I've given them every bit of the best I could come up with in terms of retribution and, and, you know, a good fight. I'm a, I'm a God loving American and I'm not giving in any which way. Amen. Amen. Amen to that, John. And, you know, I think you do stand out. You, you, you were able and have been able to, to do that. And that truth is, is pretty phenomenal. I mean, you are an individual that isn't after popularity, fame, money. You're interested in family and love and the realness of the entire thing. Um, amen to the, uh, being open-minded and, and, to, to all this. And it's not that simple. Like you said, that, that very often it's, there's so many people that want to put things in boxes, you know, it's, it's demonic or it's, it's extraterrestrial or it is interdimensional. And I think all these things, as you know, better than anyone, uh, there's proof that there's a lot more going on. You have, portals opening on the property and be, being a social worker and a therapist, how have you dealt this? I, I can only imagine how have you dealt with this and your wife uh, interacting with these beings that don't belong? Well, you know, Ryan, it's kind of interesting. Um, I'm not a violent person by nature. Uh, I mean, I, I grew up pretty hard in Chicago and tough, um, you know, which is where I'm from. And, you know, I grew up in the, the late 50s and the 60s, so I, I saw a lot of social change, and I had to do a lot of, you know, personal adaptation in order to survive and, and to, uh, 
you know, try to be the best person I could be. So I, I, you know, I've gone through a lot of change in my life. Um, and so when this happened here, I just kind of took it in stride and I said, okay, you know, um, you, the, you know, the big picture is no matter what, this is my property and I'm going to stay here as long as I want to be here. And I'm going to make sure that these other beings understand that I have no beef with them, but you don't get to come to my property and raise hell and get away with it. It's just that simple. I make the rules and you guys are going to deal with it. And if you don't, you're going to get the sharp end of a sword up your ass. And that's exactly what ended up happening. And, uh, you know, samurai sword, you know, has been the, uh, I don't know, sort of the uh, way that I've uh, been able to protect the property and protect my animals and protect my wife. Uh, at one point, she had, she was uh, attacked to the point where she was floated out of the house up into a craft. And, uh, it, you know, Samurai Sword wouldn't work anymore, so AK-47 became the uh, weapon of choice. But uh, beyond that, you know, I, I'm not a, a violent person. I didn't want to have to struggle and fight with these things. If they could have just come here and you know made their peace with me and and we could have coexisted i was cool with that i would have allowed that but that's not that's not what they wanted you know they wanted to be able to kick us off the property try to scare us off and take the property not happening i john i mean that is many people you know you really stand out to me as one of the heroes of the paranormal if you want to call it that there's really just so many genres but Many people have not been able to handle these types of things, and your willpower and faith is obvious. The, the, the samurai sword, it's interesting that you use that because that is such a significant device or tool, at least historically for mankind. You know, it takes so much. I'm sure having, having had a samurai sword, I'm sure you're aware of the history and and, and and how important that is and i i want it i know you're not a violent person but i want to ask if you don't mind about the ex, the experience of the levitation uh that, that it, with your wife well i mean it, it just we uh throughout these experiences my wife has been sort of what they picked on uh you know i don't know if it's just because she was the most vulnerable but, um, you know, if we had experience after experience where we'd be asleep at night. And I, I, I'm a person that, that sleeps very lightly, and I'm very aware of my environment. And, you know, each time that they came, uh, they would try to sneak in in the middle of the night and try to do something to her. And over several different experiences, I caught them in the process of trying to take her and, uh, you know, I wasn't having any of that. And she was totally asleep. She almost slept through the whole experience until right before she got lifted up into, uh, like, through a cone of light up into one of the ships. And, uh, you know, she had implored me over and over and over again, no matter what, don't let them take me. And I said, well, Joyce, you realize something, and that is, is that if I'm out there having to use a gun of any kind, there's a good possibility you might get caught in the crossfire. And she goes, I don't care. Do whatever you've got to, to save me and keep me from being taken. And, uh, you know, in this particular case that occurred, I, I had no choice except to, you know, use the AK. And, uh, you know, I dumped two clips into the, uh, where the cone of light emanated from the uh, ship. And they cut off the light and dropped her. And she fell on top of me. And I tried to catch her the best I could, but it was about 20 to 25 feet, and she's not a real small woman. And so uh, we both ended up getting hurt and ended up going to the hospital. And within about 72 hours after we went to the hospital, the next thing I know, we were, uh, we were being visited by Center for Disease Control and a bunch of different agencies and you name it. I mean, you know, you talk about the men in black. Well, these were like the men in black in nice suits instead of, you know, cheap crummy suits. And, uh, you know, they were absolutely serious about talking to us and find out what was happening and, you know, how we were surviving. And uh, unfortunately, in the case of my wife, she ended up having uh, all of these skin lesions all over her. She was terribly ill. She almost died from it. She's still suffering from it. 
And uh, I was fortunate in the fact that I was really sick with it for about a week to 10 days uh, from exposure to the radiation. But I ended up recovering, and, you know, I've just been trying to keep up the good fight ever since. Yeah, I hear you. That, I, I, the, the skin lesions and the sickness and the radiation, I'm sure you've heard of Morgellons. And, and I mean, this is very common. There's, there's the, the center of disease control showing up. I mean, that is kind of like weirdness times 10. It, there, there's a lot. I, I'm originally from Utah and um, I have visited some areas that you're aware of that are very, you know, interesting as well, similar to yours. Um, I'm fascinated when, when she was dropped from the ship, the, I, I know I couldn't, I couldn't catch my wife and I'm sure that the injuries were substantial. So, I mean, you you're kind of a hero in that respect. What did the, what did the spaceship look like? I, I know you mentioned that there was a cone of light and I know Whitley Strieber has mentioned something very similar to that. And although these motive, I don't want to, I don't want to put them in boxes, John, but I know that the others, as many call them, these creatures that sneak in and abduct people, and I'm sure they would have abducted your wife if you weren't such a light sleeper, and um, they go after, you know, obviously this is what they do. Um, what do you think their motivations are? I know that that's just a theory and we don't know, but you probably, being at Ground Zero, do you have... Any idea what their motivations were? What did their ship look like? I have so many questions, man. It's like unreal. Well, as far as motivation goes, realize something, Ryan. I have never had one bit of communication with these teams at all. Um, you know, I tried. I mean, I you know, I did everything from. I mean, I literally you know put up pictures on the walls uh, of the, you know, I tried to find ways to communicate with them. I did, I did everything I could humanly think of, you know, I've tried, you know, not fighting with them. I have tried, uh, you know, just standing there staring at them until they disappeared. I mean, you know, um, the bottom line is, is that, you know, that they, they, I have a feeling they've been doing this for a long time to various different people. And, and so they're kind of used to being able to scare people and, and get away with it. It's intimidation. It's a matter of uh, most people don't have enough control over their emotions to be able to, you know, figure out what they want to do next. My thing was this. I, I warned them in no uncertain terms that I was going to fight them every which way and that I didn't want to do that. But, you know, they weren't welcome to just, you know, come in my house like predators and hurt my animals and hurt my wife and try to hurt me. I got scars all over me. I mean, bad scars. You know, I look like a, like I was a, a night fighter for a, a profession or something. And, uh, you know, I mean, I went from 280 pounds down to 160, uh, due to, you know, be, becoming ill because of this whole thing. Uh, you know, like I told you before, my wife's dying from it. I mean, she has a, uh, literally, uh, you know, a, a life-threatening disease that there's no cure from. And, you know, we've been told that, that there's lots of people that have been on recovery teams and all sorts of things around the world. Anytime you have the exposure to these crafts, it, it's quite likely you're going to come down with these illnesses. So, you know, this is, you know, we're, we're just one more case amongst many that are out there. The bottom line is, is that I'm the only person that came out and talked about it, you know. I'm not like all these other paranormal guys that are out there, you know, rehashing stories about, you know, experiences that happened, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago. This is here and now. This is real. This is, you know, this is what's happening. And, you know, there are these ships. There are these groups. There are many different branches of ETs that are out there, species. Um, they are coming to the to you know, the earth and they, they are, some of them been here for thousands of years. It's just that, uh, you know, people just don't come out and talk about it. Um, you know, I, I'm the only one, I guess that, 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 you know, has had the, uh, I don't know, the, uh, balls to come out and talk about it. I have to agree, John. Um, and, and as, as far as coming to earth, you're so on point. I think you're right. They've been here possibly longer than we have or at least visiting the planet. I, I recently, this is something I probably shouldn't have taken on, but I recently purchased a property 
south of the old Sherman Ranch, adjacent to uh, one of the most active spots, and I've run into nothing but trouble. And you're the only one I know who has basically, for over 20 years, been able to be at, at ground zero, so to speak, and um, you've been able to, well, you, you've warned them, um, you've, you've fought with them, you've reached out, so to speak, you've tried to be peaceful with them. Um, they've been doing this for a long time. They, it, it's really interesting, John, something that really, really kind of struck a chord with me. One of my best friends, uh, he is, I would consider him a contactee. And you mentioned control over your emotions. And he often mentions to me that that was the message, that if you're able to control your emotions, that that is a big deal. And you've done that. How have you been able to do that it, in the light of all this, I mean, it's a war zone. It is. It truly is, Ryan. I, I grew up in a time when um, I was very interested in the martial arts. I was very interested in Kung Fu. And I studied uh, on my own as well as uh, actually had some instruction. And one of the first things you learn, and that is, is that the body um, it is something that if you listen to it and, and you, you learn to, to uh, master it, you're in a position where you can control almost every aspect of it. And one of the things that I learned very early, and that was that, that fear um, is not an element of control. So you cannot allow fear to manifest in you and for you to, to react to it. And so I have no fear of anything. You know, I fully accept the fact that I'm vulnerable. I fully accept the fact that, you know, anything could happen, but I choose for those things not to happen. And so I choose for myself to be an instrument of my own control. And so I'm in a position where, you know, when I'm in these uh, firefight experiences, I, I'm, you know, I'm fully, I'm completely you know, manifested of, of my ability to control every aspect of myself. And uh, that's why the samurai sword is such a good weapon for me, because it allows me to be able to reach out and do exactly what I need to do. And uh, I also, I live in a brick house. Uh, literally, it is a huge brick house. And uh, guns, <laughs> guns are not a good thing. Uh, bullets bounce, and, you know, they do a lot of damage. So the samurai sword is a much better weapon of defense. Yeah, I was I was mesmerized by that because I think you're absolutely right. The samurai sword, I mean, for thousands of years, I I'm amazed by, you know, I've studied the samurai and exactly what you're saying is is just it's just really striking a lot of uh interest with me because they were in fact very in tune with their surroundings and always aware of their peripheral and the samurai sword is you know it keeps them at a distance that if they're that close to you they deserve what they get and i think you're a very peaceful man i don't think you're a violent man i think we were i mean obviously you're christian you're aware of the body and we're, we're built in his image and we are divine and the fact that you have no fear yet you're vulnerable and you control every aspect of this. Do you think when it stepped up to the firefight experiences, what, what, what were you like? I guess what I'm trying to ask is obviously that's kind of taken it to the next level. They, they, it sounds like they started to make it even more personal. Well, no, I, I can tell you this, and that is there is not a moment during these experiences that I haven't been in prayer. I have always asked for forgiveness. I have always asked for guidance. And I have always been in a place where I have, you know, said, Lord, I am deeply, deeply troubled by these experiences. And I don't want them to go the way they're going, but I don't know what else to do. And I've asked to have, uh, you know, some kind of, of uh, help 
And along the way, I got some of that help. I actually ended up being introduced to several other races. And at this point, we have one race that has interceded and most of the violence has ended. Um, we, we've been fortunate that way. And I literally have, uh, you know, photographic images. These, these beings have allowed me to photograph them up close. So I have proof that they're here and that they, they have now basically taken over the management of the ranch in terms of, uh, you know, and the grays are, are terrified of these things. Uh, the mantis beings are absolutely will not tolerate uh, the kind of stuff that has been going on here. And I guess they, they I don't know, they heard my prayers or <laughs> heard my, my cries for help. And uh, we're, we're not having the, the kind of violent experiences that we used to have here anymore. And it all happened due to the fact that uh, one of them showed up and it didn't speak to me or communicate with me. All it did was stand there in front of me. And uh, I, I was shocked to see it because, you know, most of the stuff just sounds like a bunch of hokey BS. But the problem is, is that when it happens to you, you don't have a choice except to believe it. And that's what happened. And so I, I, I just sat there or stood there in front of this being and I said, I hope you're here for good. I'm not interested in fighting with you. I'm not interested in trying to hurt you. In fact, if you could, I wish you would, you would vanquish the grays that are here. And ever since that time, the, the grays are still here. They come and they go, but they have not made any uh, attempts to hurt me or to hurt my wife or to hurt my animals. They just seem to come and go very rapidly. And you see them for a few seconds as they, they kind of go in and out of phase, and then they're gone. And every once in a while, this, this uh, mantis shows up, and it just kind of walks through, and, and that's it. I mean, it's kind of like it's saying, hey, you know what? We're, we're, we're here, and we're in charge, and nothing's going to hurt you. So, you know, I, I'm very cool with that. That's that, John, I think that's great that you um... – but, you know, I, I, I don't like to go down that like extremely, of course, I'm Christian, and but I don't want to, you know, turn it into a religious podcast. But I think that's great that you're praying for forgiveness. And, and with, you know, with him, all things are possible. Your ability to succeed has obviously uh, been proven. And these beings, these these several other races, the it just kind of goes to show there's, there's good and bad. The grace, you know, I, I know a lot of people think of them as order takers or worker bees but the mantis i mean they're, they're perhaps the most mysterious and a lot of people call them the overseers and i know when i ever whenever i see an actual like just just a praying mantis in the yard or the garden or in the outdoors i, I do my best to you know make sure that it's safe and and what does the mantis do it takes it eats the other bugs i mean it, it i don't want to talk in riddles but they uh, they appear to be it's it's interesting that you put them in that light because i've heard a very interesting story in, in a place called fruitland utah where some individuals had some experiences with mantis and the mantis they they got the exact same vibration or um the specific idea that you were trying to get across that they are more positive Right. Well, I mean, I, I'm I'm grateful that that you know order has been sort of restored here to a certain extent. Um, you know, but it, it, honestly, this is not some place that I plan to stay for the rest of my life. Uh, you know, I'm hoping to kind of just clean up the ranch and use it for other purposes, and you know, move away someplace where we can do what our original plan was. Um, you know, but we'll see. Uh, recently, I've had an individual come forward that managed to procure photographs of the ranch from a satellite. Uh, at least this is how he tells the story. And the photographs that I've seen are uh, kind of mind-blowing because we were told originally that there was some kind of object that was under the ranch. And we've been told that over and over and over again. And a few years ago, Robert Bigelow sent out a crew here uh, to investigate the ranch, and they were here for almost a week. 
And we were told that they would tell us at the end of the, the uh, exploration process what was here. Well, Bigelow offered to buy the ranch many times, but he never wanted to pay anything that was worth selling it for. And so I refused to sell it to him. And he refused, I guess, to give me the information because I never received it. Well, somehow or another, somebody managed to get that information and we were able to actually see some of the photographs. And it looks like there is a ship or some kind of very large object underneath the ranch. And it may be that that is key to the different things that are here and why they're here and that this has been here for, you know, hundreds if not thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And that was what I was alluding to when I said that we have some surprising new developments because uh, very clearly there is something here under the range. That is a surprising new development, John. That's, you know, Robert Bigelow, as you I, I know you're aware, is definitely a pioneer in this. And, and if there's some kind of object under the ranch, um, it's, that, that, that's, that's, that's huge. That is huge information. It's interesting that you mentioned it's a ship or something under the ranch because an individual um, near... The Uinta Basin. Well, it, it's it's very close to the epicenter of some of, some of the activity. An individual also that I know very. He's per, a good guy. He um, shot at something, and he was visited much like you were by some government types afterwards. And he also was shown some of these satellite images that. When he told me about them, and I don't want to put, I don't want to mess his words up, but it was more along the lines of the clarity. He didn't know if it was a drone or a satellite, but the, you know, the high definition there was, they had footage of, of him actually shooting at this and said, you can't do that anymore. Well, regardless of that, I think that's a human reaction. And, and, and I, I hate to go back to the, the mantis, but you know, in Native American and African folklore, the I believe it's the Khoisan tribe of Africa specifically regard the mantis as possibly the first living creature upon Earth who, you know, that I think that might be interesting just from the otherness perspective that, you know, these are both dep depending on what people think of greys or not. What is your opinion of the greys and what do you think they're doing? Well, I, I'm very aware that there's various different varieties of grays. Um, you know, we've seen the little ones that are about three and a half feet tall. Um, we've seen some that are about maybe five feet tall. And then we've seen some that are uh, the tall white grays that are at least six feet tall. I'm six three and they're, they're almost my size. Um, those don't seem to be particularly violent. They just seem to be there for kind of like uh, managerial or supervisory uh, responsibilities. But the small ones and the mid-sized ones are the ones that, that uh, you know, get into all the, the bad behavior. And, I mean, I've had hand-to-hand, -hand, you know, fights with, with the, the small ones and the, and the mid-sized ones. And... Uh, they they literally seem to uh, kind of like pop in and out. They don't move like you know humans do, where humans you know uh, have a you know bipedal locomotion. They literally just kind of disappear from one one place to another instantaneously, and they they just seem to go in and out of phase. And you have to kind of calculate where they're going to be, uh, you know, the, in the next. Uh, when they when they kind of pop back in, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's 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 sort of a guessing game. Um, and, but I once you've been around them long enough, you, you, it's like you know how uh, you have a chess match and you you have different pieces that move in different positions. Uh, it's kind of the same thing. Amazing. They, when I think it's interesting, uh, very interesting. You say it's a guessing game because. I've spoken with some other individuals who had some time at research centers, etc., where they claim to have portal activity, and that's what they say, that it is this, 
guessing game that you can either be right or you can be wrong. And the the popping in and out, I mean, that sounds very dimensional. It, is it with the hand to hand combat? I I want to ask. I've got so many questions, John. This is so amazing. But what did they feel like to you? Um, you actually had contact, like physical contact. Well, they they ran. They, they kind of have the skin texture of like a a snake. You know, like if you were touching a boa constrictor uh, or a python. Um, they're not warm to the touch at all. They're they're sort of a cool. Uh, you know, sort of a neutral temperature. Um, they have a sort of a, I don't know, it, it, it's, there's, it, it's a very strange thing. I mean, um, I mean, I've ended up sort of, you know, unfortunately I've had to play like alien whack-a-mole with them and, and uh, you know, stand off, and, you know, and, and fight them, like I said, hand to hand. You know, if you, if you take the head, it severs the antenna and the body stays. If you don't take the head, just the whole thing disappears. Um, they, they, in some cases, they smell like absolute rotten garbage. I mean, they smell like spoiled meat. They're disgusting, uh, horrible smelling. Um, I don't know. I, I, you know, I don't have the first notion of why they're here. Um, you know, and nothing's ever been explained to me. This place didn't come with like a DVD. Uh, you know, or a set of written instructions or nothing. I mean, I just literally walked in off the street and just started having problems practically from day one. And, uh, you know, I've just kind of had to guess my way through. Mm -hmm. A question I have about the madness, and this is just from things I've read. Um, I've, I've heard of individuals, and this may or may not be factual, that they've encountered them wearing long robes or in a variety of colors, and some were unclothed. Were they clothed, the mantis that you saw, or were they unclothed? Or both? Um, well, I didn't see the whole body. All I saw was literally the face, uh, and that's what I photographed. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you, you know, it was, in, in both cases, it, apparently, I, you know, I'm sure we kind of have a reputation, or I have a reputation for not being exactly the greatest host when it comes to ETs. Um, you know, due to the nature of how things have been here. And so in, in the case of the, the mantis beings, they, they didn't come all the way through, uh, you know, into our dimension. It was literally just kind of stuck their head through, and, and uh, that was all they allowed. So I don't really know what the rest of them looks like. Sure. No, and that's, that's kind of the – they're commonly um... – described as like you said overseers they pop in they pop out they're looking and they're just making sure that things are running the way they're supposed to run that's interesting the the I'm, I'm blown away and very interested in asking you about you mentioned that they felt uh the grays the uh I, I believe you said three and a half foot to five foot tall variety were a little bit more devious and and they felt in your hand-to-hand -hand combat they felt like snake-like and i recently spoke with a very intelligent individual who mentioned that a lot of these ancient cultures were interested in this snake worship much of which has been erased from history and it focused around many of these dimensional if you want to call them intra or extraterrestrial beings that um were for lack of a better word we weren't sure of their intentions on Earth. The elites were praying to them for power and projections and other means of education. Yet it sounds like there could be some human DNA harvesting. Is From your experiences, um, from a little darker point of view, do you think they were targeting you? Obviously, you, you, you were there. They were there as well. But were they targeting you for any particular purpose? That I don't know. All I know is is that I have places where, you know, um, I have had skin taken, I've had blood taken, uh, pretty much anything that you can take from a human being I've had taken from me. Uh, my wife has puncture marks in her as well. Uh, we know the animals have had, uh, you know, punctures. Uh, we've had horses, unfortunately, uh, you know, back in the 90s, late 90s, that were killed. They were mutilated. They had hooves 
uh, taken. They, they, uh, the anus was cored out and the, the guts inside the horse were taken. Uh, the eyes were taken. Um, you know, and all that is recorded history. I mean, we, you know, we, we, uh, filled out police reports. We filled out, um, you know, the livestock bureau agents were out here, uh, you know, the whole works. So what I would tell you is that there, I can't imagine that they're, they're not taking those things, uh, for some reason that, you know, is either going to be some kind of cellular, uh, reproduction purpose or, you know, I, I mean, you know, it could have something to do with uh, hormones, and and you know, we we hear stories about adrenochrome. Uh, it could be that you know all these things are being used that way. Um, it, it, it's just you know, unfortunately, when you're the victim, uh, as much as I hate to refer to myself as a victim of anything, um, you know, you don't get the the uh, overview. All you get is you know, sort of the end result. Um, so I, I can't really speak authoritatively about any of this other than the fact that I lived through it I survived it and my wife survived it and you know we're, we're just continuing to try to find a way off this ranch I mean if somebody would would uh, you know help us to find a place that we could afford to move to uh, that we can have our horses and continue to do the rescue work that we do with the animals we would get rid of this place in a heartbeat and, and move on mm-hmm. uh, this is not you know I, I'm you know, I've been kind of dragged into being the ambassador of all this, but this is not my chosen, you know, life profession. Uh, you know, and, and there's there's so much that I, no matter how many hours that I would sit here and talk to you about these experiences, there's just no way that I can convey to you um, the depth of everything that's happened. Uh, this ranch has become the focal point or some of the most important individuals in the world that are uh, involved not only in the paranormal, but in, in many other science and scientific aspects. Um, you know, July 29th of 2009, I had a chance to ask, you know, uh, my list of over 100 questions. If you ever meet an ET that's willing to sit down and talk to you about uh, life, uh, you know, I sat down with this list and asked, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of questions. And I got the answers and I got proof that this is all real. And as much as I didn't want it to be, you know, I really didn't want it to be real, but it is, it is real, you know, to the hundredth power. Mm -hmm. I mean, humans do not have any clue, you know, how real this whole thing is. And it's not just this ranch. This is going on around the world. It has been going on around the world for over 8,000 years. You know, we, we have literally, the portals have allowed us to see things and to uh, have contact with things in terms of information that I've never divulged uh, because it, it's just too phenomenal. You know, I'm, I'm right now trying to find somebody that wants to sit down with me and write the books. Mm-hmm. Uh, we thought we had people that would do that, but unfortunately things fell apart with that. And uh, so we're, we're right now looking for, you know, people that are professional writers that uh, are willing to sit down with me and, and tell these stories and, and include the videos and the photographs and put the whole thing out there. Wow. Yeah. That's, I, you know, I think a book is definitely in your future, John, and I'm by no means skilled. I, I mean, I've written a few, but I'd be honored to help you out with any of that. So like in the future, that's a whole other story, but I, I wanted to ask you just know that I'm, I'm there for you. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you. It's, it's 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 interesting that you know the horses i mean they're such beautiful animals i've been a horse owner myself and i i I was very it's kind of scary when when it goes from cattle to horses because we we interact differently with that animal and you know i know i've seen your scars the 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 pictures of skin taken um the maybe they are doing cellular reproduction the adrenochrome, the, the fact that you mentioned that, it's is really interesting to me because I Stephen Hawking's, uh, who recently passed, he he was under the impression that yes, these entities, and I mean we're talking very intelligent people, like you said, you have become the focal point of this. And Stephen Hawking mentioned that these things most likely do not like us, and we become their focal point for whatever reason. 
they they don't like us they they observe us and they try to incorporate us in some kind of study and um i i think you're there's there's some recent information i believe it was well from the scientific perspective they don't like us and other properties you've been the long term you're the you're the home run king right now as far as absolutely being able to long term deal with this um the old sherman ranch has changed hands various times uh, mr bigelow himself sold it i think when he got tired of it he's obviously interested in your property as well and um this these civilizations which may have long existed they seem to be isolated in areas like you said that have portals have you witnessed any of these 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 portals opening up or have you seen any any examples of of portal sh activity many times i have photographs of the portals uh, opening outside uh, to the point where I actually have a photograph of of the portal in, in the uh, composite photo with the mountains behind us, and it will it, it actually shows how large this portal is. I mean, it's to the point where you could fly, you know, seven forty sevens through it. It's huge. Um, the one in the living room is is of moderate size. Uh, we've had lots of people that have come and experienced that phenomenon. Um, that the, the, see, the thing that's really unique beyond just all the things I've already said, and that is that the portals here on this property seem to be not only capable of transmitting matter from point A to point B, but they seem to have a time aspect to them where they can go back and forth in time. And so what's happening is things from the past are coming into the current time period and things from the time, the current time period are going into the past and they're interacting. Mm -hmm. And that makes this particular set of coordinates, uh, you know, quite a bit more complicated and quite a bit more interesting than maybe your, your standard portal. Um, you know, and that has been also sort of a key factor to some of the teams that have come here and examined these, uh, you know, everything here on the range. And it's not just our ranch. Uh, Rainbow Valley is full of this. Uh, there, there are other properties where these things exist. I'm not sure people are aware of them, but they do exist. Yeah, I agree with you. These these things don't know boundaries. I think your 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 ranch is definitely an epicenter, and the time aspect to them. It. it I, I recently spoke with an individual who came out doing some research in Utah, actually, and he mentioned that these ob have you had any objects moving that, you know, um, you have seen, look, for example, you lose something and then it's in another room or, or have you had any, any, anything Mandela effect type like Absolutely. That? Okay. Absolutely. We've had, I, I, the, one of the very first things that happened on this ranch was that I, my wedding ring. Uh, I was, you know, I do, I do a lot of work on cars. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of a half-assed mechanic. I wouldn't call myself a real mechanic. I'm just a guy who's a wannabe. But um, I, I was working on a vehicle, and I took my wedding ring off, and I, I set it, uh, you know, next to the radiator under the hood. And then when I was getting ready to, when I finished the work and I was getting ready to start the vehicle up, I went to put my wedding ring back on. And it was gone. And I was, I looked everywhere for it. There, you know, I mean, <laughs> I was, you know, just heartbroken because my wife gave it to me. And, you know, that was one of the first important symbols of our marriage. And uh, it, it just was gone. Well, it was 20 years, practically to the day. And I was in bed. I had just woke up in the morning and... I felt something on my hand and I looked at my ring finger and there was my ring. 20 years passed by. Wow. Man. But that's happened with lots of other things. I mean, keys, wallets, uh, you know, personal items, tools, uh, you name it. I mean, I, we had a cat in Gumby that uh, disappeared in, in uh, 
early December, he was literally chased through the house by a couple of these greys, and then he just disappeared in thin air. And I was heartbroken because he's a really good cat. And, um, you know, I kept praying on it, kept asking for some kind of intervention and, you know, try to get him back. About four weeks later, I went out to my uh, Suburban to get in it and feed the horses. And the cat was asleep on the uh, passenger seat in a locked vehicle with the windows up. So it's not just objects that disappear and come back. It's animals as well. Mm -hmm. These, the, the, um, usually this is fascinating. The 20 year mark for your wedding ring, usually these items and there's, there's people as you're aware, uh, like Mr. Bigelow and others, uh, very high in the, in, in, in the community, as far as a scientific perspective, they've analyzed these things. And usually these items will go missing and reappear usually seconds or minutes. That 20 year mark is so mind blowing because I was told that these possibly may be anchor points for these entities to re-enter the timeline. So that 20 years is like, wow, that is, um, that's amazing. It's the time aspect to them and the objects moving and the grounding. This, what's, what's really interesting about these items is they've been tested scientifically. Oftentimes they aren't the same item. They're, they're, well, they're, they're similar in that they are the same item, but they have differences molecularly than what was there before. Is it, We obviously know that Bigelow doesn't investigate anything that doesn't have merit. And I think that that uh, speaks volumes to your property, your experiences, and the barrage of attacks that you've encountered. Um, you're an inspiration to the rest of us, John, and, and I, just, I just blessings to you and your family. Your honesty and truthfulness are just so, so refreshing. Uh, I, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day. I know you've had a really hectic day today, and you still took the time out to speak with me. And, and I, I can't thank you enough. I think you're, you're, you're a great guy, and I appreciate you being on the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. Uh... You know, I'm just trying to be the best man I can be and do do right by myself, my family, and my country. Amen. I hope to speak you to, to you again, and uh, thanks again. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Man, oh man. An individual who is... A definite hero of the paranormal, hand-to-hand -hand combat with greys, small and medium size. And what do they feel like? Apparently snake-like. Tall whites also seen popping in and out of dimensions. Uh, much of this is of interest to me and others. And he's had skin taken. Horses killed. I've, I've been a horse owner myself. This is rough. Owning a paranormal property is not an easy business. He's been vulnerable. He's had experience after experience. Uh, luckily, he sleeps very lightly. And, you know, he's been able to interact with these others, as many call them. Even though their motivations aren't known. He's witnessed the cone of lights the portals, what the ship looked like. We hear this time and time again from our fellow abductees, contactees, and just witnesses. People like Whitley Strieber, Travis Walton, uh, many more. And regardless of your perception or idea of it all, uh, Mr. John Edmonds has relied on prayer and uh, his belief. He's a patriot. He's a Christian. Uh, blessings to him for all that he's dealing with in the Rainbow Valley, a very paranormal valley indeed. He has encountered these anchor points of missing objects that allow these entities to re-enter the timeline. Usually it's seconds, minutes, or hours. His wedding ring hit the 20-year mark. He's an inspiration to many of us. Uh, the time aspect, 
the objects moving, the hand-to-hand -hand combat, it's UFO Central. Reminds me so much of so many places in Utah, as well as Arizona. Very trying experiences. Um, everything from samurai swords to AK-47s. There is something going on at the Stardust Ranch. And uh, there's something going on at a lot of other ranches as well. If you haven't already, please do me a favor and read The Utah UFO Ranch. It explains that a lot of these paranormal properties are in fact connected, if not directed towards a whole new way of looking at reality and the universe itself and our part in it. Something's got to give. Uh, sometimes we become more aware of this. Uh, Stephen Hawking himself mentioned that it's very likely that these entities or varieties of these entities don't like us at all. They possibly hate us. Tom DeLonge has said the same thing to the Stars Academy. Whether individuals or groups, these greys may be worker bees, order takers, dimensional robots, so to speak, biological entities doing the bidding of others. Sure, there's good and bad beings. Our ability to understand this is very limited. Given the amount of resources we are allowed not to see, it is possible our government knows more. It's more possible they're not telling us. And the time aspect is possibly one of the most interesting to me. Objects moving, grounding points. Can't wait to get out to the Rainbow Valley. Uh, blessings to everybody that's listening tonight for the time you've taken out of your own hectic schedules to uh, listening to things not so well known. So I wholeheartedly thank you. Please do your best to support Hero Paranormal Podcast and all of its affiliates. We don't do this for the money. We barely keep the lights on. So hop over to HeroParanormal.com. Shoot us a buck. Shoot us five bucks. Shoot us nothing. Just check it out. Also hop over to SpaceWolfResearch.com. I will continue to do my best to bring you the heroes of the paranormal, the cryptozoological, the fringe of society, secret societies, and everything else that falls outside of the parameters of the well-accepted narrative. There's more to this reality, ladies and gentlemen, and I will do my best to bring it to you. I would like to thank Mr. John Edmonds one more time, the Stardust Ranch, and uh, all of the people who take time to listen to Hero Paranormal Podcast. Keep your eyes to the skies, feet on the ground, but don't forget to take a look around. Blast off in my time machine. Third eye feeling like an Eve. I seen blast off.